Hey everyone, and welcome to the first episode of my newest series, making a game entirely in the Desmos graphing calculator. This episode is going to be about two main topics, what my plans and goals are for my game, and what inputs are available for a player to use in the calculator. So I should preface this episode and perhaps the entire series by saying a few things. Firstly, I've never made a game before, let alone one in Desmos. The closest experience I've ever had is I've taken a single computer science class in high school, but I really don't think it'll help me out much here, so I consider myself going into this basically blind. Number two, I'm here entirely for a good time. If I was trying to make a good game, I wouldn't be using Desmos. I've always used Desmos throughout middle and high school, and the idea to make a game came to me while I was finishing up some calc homework. I'm trying this purely to see if it's possible. Number three, I think I already alluded to this, I have no clue what I'm doing. My experience with Desmos is purely for my classes, so I have a general idea of what it can do, but I'm really excited to push the boundaries and really get a feel for what's possible. Because I really don't know what's possible, I don't have a solid idea of where I'm going. I have some basic goals for my project, but the small details I hope to add on as I discover them. But what are my basic goals for a game made in a graphing calculator? Well, to start, I want to create a platformer. I think that given the options I have, it will probably be the most complex thing I can realistically create. I want a few different types of enemies, or just types of threats that for the player to encounter. Really, this is all I have in mind. Everything else is for me to figure out as I go. Now that all the introduction is out of the way, I want to talk about the first major component, available inputs. Desmos has quite a few ways for users to interact and input data. The first way is probably the most obvious, typing in numbers directly to the equation space. This method is most likely the lamest and most clunky, as it almost certainly breaks all immersion with the graphing window. Personally, I'm going to try to stay away from using the direct entry input method as much as I can. I could maybe make an exit for a level have a pin, or maybe use it a secret cheat code entry space. Otherwise, I'm going to try to not use this method. The second method is a fun one. Sliders. Sliders are going to be amazing inputs to use just because of their versatility. Let's start with the most basic slider. A looping forward and backward slider is created by making any variable and assigning it a value. It does what the name implies, it loops forward and backward. Take slider v here. The parameters to include are the minimum value, the maximum value, and the step or change in your variable. A good thing to note is that the slider will always take four seconds to complete at one time speed, as shown here. Secondly, there is the repeat in one direction slider. This one is also pretty self-explanatory. This one is probably going to be less useful than looping forward and backward slider, but it does do one thing better than it. Trig functions repeat their values at 2pi, and much of the time in order to make smooth repeating patterns, it's better to have them jump back to zero immediately, rather than reverse direction, as shown by this tracing circles example. Another option is the play once slider. It's very similar to the last two sliders, so I won't repeat myself. This one will be great for jumping commands or special actions in general. Lastly, there is a plague indefinitely slider. This one is quite different from the rest as it has no maximum and the speed works in an entirely new way. The idea is that the slider will start at the minimum and increase by the step amount once per second. This will be very useful for the time variable that will in essence drive the game. The final method for controlling inputs is the most integrated but also probably the least flexible. Points in Desmos are great for changing values directly on the graph and having a direct interaction with the game. Points can be made to be completely free to move or be locked in either the X or Y axis. I could see movable points as a great way to implement movable objects or as menu selection nodes. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next time for collision detection and basic physics implementation. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask in the comments below. Until next time.